Let's get right to it. The Vatican is confirming that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's health has declined, but they claim he is not suffering from any immediate health risks. Italian journalist Massimo Franco and former Vatican spokesman Federico Lombardi said on Thursday that Benedict was frail but alert. Questions over the health of the 90-year-old pope were raised when his brother, Father Georg Ratzinger, told a German magazine that Benedict has a degenerative disease that could lead to total paralysis and affect his heart. The Holy See press office denied that the Pope Emeritus is suffering from the disease. This past week marked the fifth anniversary of Benedict's historic renunciation of the papacy. He wrote a brief letter to readers of an Italian daily who were concerned about him. He said that he is slowing, his strength is declining, but that internally he's on a pilgrimage home. Benedict thanked the readers and said, it is a grace to be surrounded by such love on this, quote, sometimes difficult final stretch of the road. Our prayers are with the Pope Emeritus. Also on Thursday, the Vatican revealed that Pope Francis meets with victims of sexual abuse regularly. The comment comes on the heels of what has become a public relations nightmare after Francis was dismissive of reported clerical abuse and a cover-up in Chile. Seeking to defuse a mounting scandal, spokesman Greg Burke said the Pope meets privately with victims, usually on Fridays, several times a month. Burke said Pope Francis is there to listen to them and try to help them to heal their serious wounds. Burke's statement coincided with the release of a transcript of a recent meeting Francis held with Jesuits in Chile and Peru. He told them that the percentage of abusive pedophile priests was not a lot, but that it's terrible if even it were, if it were just one of our brothers. Juan Carlos Cruz, one of the alleged Chilean victims who appeared on The World Over last week, responded to the Vatican comments, saying that if Francis truly listened to victims, he would have learned how much they suffer, particularly when they're mistreated by their own pastors. We shouldn't have to wait, he said, until the media are banging on the door to do something. And Christians in China are feeling the tightening noose of the communist regime's new regulations on religion. According to reports, minors have been banned from entering places of worship in several regions in China, while Protestant house churches in the Henan province have been forced to close. Meanwhile, government officials are cracking down on underground Catholics, those loyal to Rome, forbidding them and their communities to celebrate Mass. One Shanghai priest has told his parishioners not to come to Sunday Mass because there won't be one due to new enforcement measures. According to the regulations, authorities have been directed to crack down on, quote, illegal religious activities and foreign infiltration. They are to prevent religious organizations from interfering with local public affairs and to stop the construction of churches and religious statues without prior approval. The new regulations went into effect on February 1st. And as an accord between the Vatican and Communist China on the appointment of bishops nears, the former bishop of Hong Kong continues to speak out against the deal. Cardinal Joseph Zen says that the plan to recognize seven bishops approved by Beijing is a betrayal of the underground church in China. Vatican and Chinese officials who support the agreement say it's a way to heal the 70-year-old rift between the Holy See and Beijing, and a way to bring the communist state-run church and the underground church together in unity. According to the proposed terms, Pope Francis's recognition of the Beijing-approved bishops, all of whom were excommunicated, would in turn give Rome the right to veto future appointments by Beijing. According to reports, some of these Beijing bishops have familial relationships, that is to say, girlfriends and children. Cardinal Zen remains adamant in his opposition, saying that the Vatican is, quote, putting wolves before your flock, and they are going to make a massacre. Zen says that the loyal faithful in China are being asked to surrender to the communist regime. 
Here with analysis is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, with me in studio, and from Manhattan, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. I want to begin with Father Antonio Spadaro. He's the Jesuit editor-in-chief of La Civiltà Cattolica, a very influential Jesuit journal in Rome, and he's known to be a close associate of Pope Francis. He's taken it upon himself to clarify and speak for the Pope all over the world. Well, he was here in D.C. this week, speaking at Georgetown. We asked Father Spadaro for a sit-down interview. He did not have time for the interview, he told us. Nonetheless, we sent a camera to his talk entitled Pope Francis's Global Vision and His Work for a More Just and Peaceful World. Pithy. Here is Father Spadaro talking about the Pope's approach to diplomacy. Listen. The Pope is light years away from the theorist of a clash of civilizations. Francis seeks to dissolve the narrative of a toxic final clash of religions that nourishes the fear of chaos. Father Jerry Murray, your reaction to uh, what you heard Father Spadaro say there? Well, that's very puzzling what he's saying because it's reducing human life to simply a game of king of the hill. And the church teaches the exact opposite. Uh, human life is about fulfilling God's will, knowing that will, and then trying to bring a society into accord with that will. And that involves identifying things that are evil, reprobating them. It identifies, you have to identify what is just and good, writing good laws to promote them. Mm. So, for instance, you know, when the church was fighting against the Roman Empire to survive, uh, we didn't say, well, the Roman Empire is acting in a just way by you know, throwing Christians to the lions. It's just a question of who's going to be in charge here. Uh, the fight against communism, which has produced so many martyrs in the 20th and even the 21st century, that is a fight of good and evil. President Reagan was right. Uh, it's identifying who your enemy is, which allows you to then speak clearly the truth. Uh, pretending there are no differences is very naive. I think Father Spadaro's words uh, have to be reconsidered because they really don't express the truth. Uh, Robert Royal, your thoughts on how what we hear here is the Pope's approach to diplomacy, mainly the notion that uh, the Pope is not here to say who is right or who is wrong and that it, it's wrong to take uh, sides for moral reasons. Do you see a connection between this and the thought laid out in Amoris Laetitia or some of his other writings? Well, I would agree with Father Murray that, first of all, this is a very puzzling statement and confusing as so many other things that we hear about from this, um, this Vatican are. Mm. To begin with, going all the way back to ancient Greece, there's been a, a debate about the, the sophists who think that everything is a matter of power and those who think that truth, goodness, uh, fair dealing is what guides human activity. Mm. To, to abolish this sort of in, in diplomacy for the sake of a conversation, sure, you could, you could do such a thing. But Not in Pope, reality. The, but in reality, the Pope certainly has views about the environment, about the international economic situation that he's stated very forcefully mm. and made judgments about. Mm. And I think he ought to if that's what, what, he, what he believes. Now, when you actually sit down with people, of course, that's a, that's a different story. You, right. you each try to get what you can in a, in a diplomatic situation. But to lay that out is we don't mix religion, the question, moral questions of right and wrong. This seems to me to abandon what the, the primary role of the church in the world is. And so, I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's a big question to say from there, do we look at Amoris Laetitia and we get the same sort of thing? But there does seem to be in that idea of accompaniment mm -hmm. and discernment, right. uh, a suspension of what we really believe. And in the meantime, we wander about in a conversation. So in some ways, if this is indeed the Pope's thinking, and we have to recognize that Father Spadaro may have a different understanding of this than Francis mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. has. Yes, there seems to be a kind of a convergence, if not an actual um, identity of these two. I want to I want to pull this out a little more because uh, Father Spadaro also published in his uh, Jesuit periodical just this week uh, the Pope's address to Jesuits in Chile. And as part of that conversation, he talks about Amoris Laetitia. We'll put it up on the screen. He says, I believe that one of the things that the church needs most today, and this thing is very clear in the perspectives and pastoral objectives of Amoris Laetitia, is 
discernment. We are used to a we can or cannot mentality. Father Jerry Murray, your reaction to that? Well, what are we discerning? Uh, we're discerning what we should and shouldn't do. What we can't or can't do is just another way of saying what we should or should not do. Discernment is not a substitution for moral judgment. It's putting moral judgment into effect. And in the life of the church, we have revelation, the natural law, mm -hmm. and the church is taught through her magisterium those things that we should do and therefore those things that we should not or cannot do if we want to remain faithful to Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, discernment is not an abolisher of the categories of the moral law. Discernment is a way to apply the moral law to specific circumstances. But you only apply a law if, number one, you believe it's true, mm -hmm. that it's valuable and good for the people to obey the law, and then you figure out, well, what are they doing that varies from the way the law is carried out? Mm -hmm. Discernment doesn't mean that, well, what we formerly said was wrong is now can be right because uh, people look at things differently. That's not what discernment means. Hmm. I want to move on to uh, this China controversy because everything Father Spadaro was speaking about really pointed to that. Uh, which is a, a simmering crisis. We've been reporting on this. In fact, we were some of the first people to report on this. We've been doing it for years. Cardinal Zen warning about a deal between China and the Vatican that would undermine the Vatican's authority, even appointing its own bishops. Here's what Father Spadaro said about this situation. Watch. Francis is walking the same path of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, trying to find a way to dialogue effectively with the Chinese authorities. The church doesn't want to give away the authority to ordain bishops. The history of the church is the history of finding agreements with the political authorities about the appointments of bishops. Robert Royal, uh, I read a piece by Father Drew Christensen this week, also a Jesuit who claims the church has been doing this for years, cooperating with China. John Paul did it, Benedict did it in the appointment of bishops. Is that? wholly true? It's partly true. Uh, what we know from the passages that have been cited by, the, by Rome at this particular moment from JP2 and from Benedict is that they said, yes, we cannot persist forever in a position of op op opposition to a government. The, the, the government. Mm -hmm. However, we must also be sure to safeguard. They go on in both places. There's a, there's a, a balance between mm -hmm. recognizing a reality and also a, affirming that the church must re remain independent. And just on the historical point, I would not say that this is like what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. There's a difference when the, the king of France, who is a Christian and presumably a Catholic, right. wants to have a say in the appointment of bishops in his realm. I don't think it's a good thing historically, and, right. and it's been good actually that, that in, the, in modern times nations no longer have a say. But whether it's the king of France or the Holy Roman Emperor, they are part of the, whole, the Christian household. When we're dealing with communist China, and, and I'm sorry to say Father Christensen, who's a, a friend to a, to a certain degree, I, I think papers over the fact that this is a communist government. He keeps on saying that this is not the old Cold War with the Soviet yeah. Union. Everyone knows that. But the DNA of communism is there in China. We've got the work camps. We've got the oppression of religion. Right. We, we've got forced abortions. We've got population control. There are no human rights res being respected. We have environmental disasters, which in spite of some persons in, in the Vatican, cannot be ignored simply because China has, has decided to remain in the Paris Accords on, on climate. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with a regime that is not simply any regime with whom you negotiate how bishops are going to be appointed. This is a regime that in its very constitution, in its ideology, in the way it acts, seeks to, to eliminate, and I don't mean that lightly, to eliminate the existence of an independent church. Yeah, no, there's no taking that away, and I don't know how people can't quite see that. I understand they're, they're wanting to make a deal, sure. but does that deal serve the faithful, martyred church in China that has been laboring? And the irony is that the people who are suffering are the ones who are saying, no, don't right. make this deal. And Cardinal Zen, Father Jerry Murray, uh, as you know, has uh, he went to the Pope. He presented a letter by one of those bishops who had been under house arrest, arrested. I mean, the man has been tortured for his faith, uh, warning about a deal with China. Where do we stand on this? And is there a dialogue? Do you see the dialogue that the Pope has promised and asked for with Cardinal Zen, members of the underground church? Well, I completely support Cardinal Zen and those who are with him trying to make the Holy See aware that this is a disastrous decision 
to cede the power to the Communist Party of China to name Catholic bishops. Uh, it really is a mistake. And, you know, what we're dealing with here is a misunderstanding of uh, how the Catholic Church should be organized. The Catholic Church is not ever a department of a government. Mm. When it becomes that, it ceases to be Catholic. That's what happened in England with the Henry VIII. Uh, the, I think the Holy Father, in his you know, laudable desire to bring peace uh, in China, is taking a wrong turn. And it's good that the, the rebellion, let's say, I mean, you can call it that, they're rebelling against this potential deal, that this is being made known because the Pope has to understand dealing with Chinese communists as if they are good faith partners to arrive at a deal that's going to promote Catholicism, mm. that's an error. That's a mistake. Mm. They want power. They, they're trying to suppress religion in China as best they can. And, you know, I would say when the Pope has said before he doesn't want a top-down church, he wants a church of dialogue, he wants local bishops to be empowered to speak freely, well, you know, I don't see a lot of dialogue going on here between the Secretary of State and the Chinese bishops about what mm -hmm. they want. This seems to be a Vatican deal, and mm -hmm. I think Cardinal Zen is the one we should listen to. Mm -hmm. What do you make, uh, Bob Royal, of uh, Archbishop Sorondo making a goodwill tour of China, returning and saying, nowhere is the church's social gospel lived out the way it's lived out and implemented in China? Yeah, I guess out of respect for a fellow Christian, the less said about that remark, the better. And I don't think it will be repeated, even though we haven't seen a rebuke from, from the Vatican, right. which perhaps ought to have been forthcoming. You know, uh, Father Raymond de Souza, who's a quite brilliant priest who lives up in Canada, he's a, a university chaplain and whatnot, has written a beautiful piece about the, the softness of this Vatican towards left-wing totalitarianism, whether it's in China, whether it's in mm -hmm. um, Venezuela, the Holy Father, and, and I believe that Father Spadaro have talked about Northern and Southern Korea coalescing as a nation under one language and a, a common culture. There seems to be an outreach to the rogue regimes mm. and a certain indulgence. I don't want to overstate this, but there is a kind of indulgence of regimes that we know are problematic. And yet a harshness toward the United States, toward Western Europe, uh, countries like Poland and Hungary that may resist uh, large in immigration inflows. There's a bias there that, that I think is quite evident to people who follow the Holy See's current mm -hmm. foreign policy. And um, it's one thing to have a desire to reach out, as you, you, you rightly say, mm -hmm. but we must be realistic. We must be tellers of the truth. If you don't want to push, you're right and he's wrong right away, okay, but we still must tell the truth. China is not a place where solidarity is being pr pr uh, practiced, yeah. where capitalism is not running the, the political system, mm -hmm. where the environment, as we know, is which is horrible in no, China. No, completely yeah. polluted. And, and, and the people and, and, are all on drugs. And he said, oh, no youth are on drugs. And, you no, didn't see them. That doesn't mean they're not on drugs. They have an opioid quite, explosion. This is quite typical of all communist regimes because mm -hmm. they don't get any input from their people. There's no response. Here in the United States, if, if there's a release uh, of chemicals into a river, somebody notices and you complain and, and the government right. responds. There, the so-called solidarity and, and, and the commonality of life together is whatever the Chinese Communist Party defines it as. Mm -hmm. And so we must confront the fact that, yeah, we're not with the Soviet Union, but this is a different form of the same kind of totalitarianism. Uh, Father Jerry, I need to play for you another comment by Father Spadaro, get your reaction to this. He talked about the culture war. Now, bear in mind, Father Spadaro is the man who, just a few months ago, wrote of the political collaboration between evangelicals and Catholics as being an ecumenism of hate. Here's what he said about the culture war. Watch. Bergoglio wants to liberate pastors from feeling, from the feeling of being a war, kind of a cultural war, surrounded and dismayed under a sort of Masada complex by which the church feels enclosed by a society it must find, fight against. Father Jerry, how do you think uh, pro-life people, people who fight for marriage and family, uh, how do you think they feel hearing that? Well, I think they would say that Father Spadaro doesn't really know what he's talking about. Uh, the culture war is not a right-wing invention to raise funds, you know. The culture war is the assault on Christian morality and natural law 
that we've been experiencing in this country and throughout the Western world, and its manifestations are clear. Contraception, abortion, euthanasia, mm. and now we have, you know, these, these fantastic schemes that people want, like fantastic in the bad sense, where you want to create human life in test tubes and then manipulate, all that kind of thing. In other words, it's a, it's a turning man into a commodity that's disposed of by the powerful according to what they want. Christianity is the light of truth that believes in the innate dignity of every human life, and when people violate that, we are going to fight back. Uh, to say that cultural warriorism is a wrong way of looking at it, you know, the, did the Christians who were being martyred in the Colosseum consider themselves to be, you know, not involved in a struggle with the Roman Empire? Of course, they mm -hmm. knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now, their martyrdom was their victory and were the beneficiaries of it. But, you know, it's very offensive to someone to say that when Catholics and Protestants cooperate to try and promote the moral law, that this is based on hatred. It's the exact opposite. It's based on love. It's based on love for everyone, especially our most needy neighbors, the unborn and the weak. Mm. And love of God, which I think as you spoke about those martyrs, I'm thinking of the Chinese martyrs today who are dying imprisoned under house arrest or lose their children and family only because of their faith. It, it really, I, I don't understand, I can't even process half of this. But let me move on. We had uh, a alleged victim of uh, this priest in Chile who was a confrere of this Bishop Barros, who the Pope appointed despite uh, getting warnings from the laity and some of these alleged victims saying this man witnessed my my being victimized. I spoke to a man named Juan Carlos Cruz last week and asked him about the centerpiece of this controversy is whether the Pope actually knew about this case long before he appointed this uh, Bishop Barros uh, as bishop of the area. This is what he told me. Watch. And it was about a letter that he shared with Cardinal O'Malley of Boston. He reassured Marie and the others that the Pope had received the letter that he had given. He said that um, he, that the Pope had received that letter. Now that letter was delivered in 2015, long before he appointed Barros as, as bishop there. Your thoughts on this and why does this continue to be a simmering controversy that the Pope can't put behind him? This is very bothersome because Cardinal O'Malley is the head of the Pope's own created commission about abuse within of the minors. church. Mm -hmm. they, they really want to take this very seriously. That commission has been allowed to lapse. It has not been reinstated. I, I would think that this would be an urgent matter for the Holy See to deal with. Now, some people have tried to say that perhaps the Holy Father mislaid the letter or he, you know, he gets 100 letters a day people give to him. But this is his own self-appointed cardinal who handed this to him. And actually, there's a picture of him receiving this right. that some of the other members of the committee took to make sure that it was recorded, that he received it. He said he would, he would read it. Now, what happened after that is we, we don't know. But certainly, there is some disconnect here that's very worrisome. This is the pope himself has said this is the most depressing element in the in the church at this moment that is something that has to be dealt with there needs to be a urgent follow through it just seems to me that it's not enough to talk about it he's been meeting with with victims every friday or almost every friday right. we just learned which came out this week, recently yeah. which is great i mean it's wonderful that he mm -hmm. he takes that personal approach and that's the the wonderful side of this pope but something has, ha got, has got to happen on an institutional level mm -hmm. so that these sorts of mishaps don't take place. They, they discredit everything else that the church has been rightly doing to deal with the mm -hmm. problem. Father Murray, your thoughts on the investigation now underway. Uh, Juan Carlos Cruz, again, that alleged victim, he met with uh, Archbishop Chicluna, who is uh, the Archbishop of Malta. You'll remember he was in headlines because he was part of that Maltese interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, which was, you know, way on the, on the other side of tradition here. Uh, he is the investigator. He's supposedly meeting with laity in Chile, but they are asked to submit full-page documents of what they intend to tell him and give that to the nuncio. How confident are you of this investigation and the results it might bear? I'm actually confident because uh, Archbishop Shakluna, when he was the uh, promoter of justice in the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith, was the one who investigated Car uh, Maciel, uh, Father Maciel, wow. the founder of the Legionaries of Christ. And he personally conducted interviews with the Maciel's victims, and there was that evidence 
uh, that brought Massiel down. So mm -hmm. he has a good track record in uh, promoting uh, justice in this matter. Mm -hmm. uh, big, the people in uh, Chile who are going to meet with the nunciature, uh, it's you know nice protocol to ask them to write down what they're going to say ahead of time. But they should be in no way feel restricted that they have to tell everything they want to the nuncio. They're giving testimony to Shakluna, not to the nuncio. Now, hopefully they're working together, but the nuncio's job is different. Shakluna is the one taking evidence in this matter. Mm -hmm. This also points out to a deeper problem, which is the question, we don't know what the Pope and his associates did as regards the allegations against Bishop Barros before the Pope appointed him to the Bishopric of Osorno in Chile. Mm. Now, the Pope has said there was no evidence, uh, that there were calumnies, that this man right. was, Slander. he found no reason to believe that this man had overlooked sexual abuse. But if this had all been done in a process where these witnesses could have been publicly notified that they were going to, testimony would be taken, uh, in other words, if we had employed normal legal practices in investigating a potential crime, I think people would be more satisfied. Right now, basically, you write letters to the Pope, to the nuncio, and then you hope something happens, but mm. you never really know. This has to change. This Pope himself had said that he would establish a tribunal to investigate episcopal, meaning bishops', bishops negligent yeah. behavior in handling these type of cases. That tribunal has never been formed, and it really should be, because right now, uh, most people's confidence in this matter has been shattered mm. when they find that one of the accusing uh, parties had submitted testimony more than two years ago, and yet the Pope, a couple of weeks ago, said there was no evidence. No evidence. Yeah, no, uh, testimony no one, no one is a form forward. of evidence. Mm -hmm. well, I want to move on before we run out of time. Uh, it was announced this week by Cardinal Supich of Chicago that he is instituting what he's calling New Momentum Conferences on Amoris Laetitia. Uh, these are based on a two-day seminar he ran last year where you had people like Archbishop Shkiluna uh, showing up and others. He's doing several of these conferences at places like Notre Dame, Boston, Boston College, um, uh, Santa Clara, and 47 bishops are participating. What is this about, and what is this new momentum on Amoris Laetitia, Robert Royal? <laughs> Uh, I feel like I'm back in 1968. I wrote a column in the Catholic thing this this week saying that uh, people used to say, uh, at least it's not 1968. I'm not so sure any longer. Back to because you look at some of the people who have been invited. There's one female theologian uh, I saw who said um, to say that God made all human beings, either male or female, is a very simplistic view. Oh. Now, if so, this, this means that all the way back at that first page in Genesis, when he says, in their image and likeness, he made them male and female, he made them, you know, that it's been wrong since the very mm. beginning. And then I would draw the conclusion that if you're asking people like that to comment on where we are right now as a church, mm. essentially, you could say everything since the beginning has been misconstrued. Mm. So, um, look, let's hope there are some good things that come out of this. Let's hope there are some other people. But I hear, for example, at Notre Dame, that the theology department not only is not involved in this conference, yeah. it wasn't even informed that this conference is taking place or they wow. don't know where it's taking place. Mm. So this is sort of something floating over our normal academic and ecclesial structures that... So they're using, they're using the, the, the prestige of these institutions but the members of it are not even invited. At least as far as Notre Dame. That's the uh -huh. only one that I'm familiar with. It's 47 bishops, Father Jerry Murray, and a number of theologians who are taking part in this. Cardinal Supich has said, Amoris Laetitia is revolutionary. It is a hermeneutic shift. What does that mean, and what do you think these conferences are about? Well, there was a conference like this at Boston College already, and at that conference, only selected journalists were allowed in. In other words, those who were favorable to what the participants were saying. So we never hear the outside scrutiny from independent journalists. Uh, this would be a disaster, again, because we need to have open and free exchange of ideas not a prepackaged set of ideas coming forward. Mm -hmm. Now, is Amoris Laetitiae, is it a revolution in the Catholic Church? Uh, that has to be judged on the basis of what it says and how that can be uh, coordinated or harmonized with all of Catholic teaching and doctrine. That's what we're currently trying to do in the Church. Uh, some bishops' conferences, like the Maltese ones, get it wrong, in my opinion. Uh, others have said, such as in Poland, there is no change. Adultery mm. continues to be an obstacle 
uh, to the reception of the sacraments. Let's see a discussion of how all of these things can be harmonized involving people of different points of view. For me, this looks like basically a cheerleading uh, propaganda type session in which everybody's going to say, look, all those conservatives and traditionalists, they no longer count. Uh, John Paul II, it was true back then, it's no longer true. All these kind of ideas are out there. This is a disaster. The Catholic Church is not a political party that changes its platform every four years at a convention. The Catholic Church is the herald of God's truth. And so the question is here not to so-and-so write this and say that. The question is, is it true according to the doctrine that Christ gave the church? Mm. And that doctrine is well known, has been defended through the years, needs to be defended today. Mm. I'll give you the last word, Robert Royal. Yeah, I, I think that we ought to look to also, there, uh, there was a lecture that Cardinal Supich gave at Cambridge University in England in the past yes. week. And he says there that we shouldn't pretend that we have all the answers which is a good thought, but I don't know too many people who think they have all the answers, and most of them are not people we pay very much attention to. But we do have Christ's answers about certain things that God chose to reveal to us, mm. and we must take those very seriously. The rest is negotiable opinions, opinions you know, mm -hmm. whatever. We can be right or wrong. We can be smart or stupid about the way we, we do these things. But we do have some answers in the church, and we don't only listen to every voice. We, mm. we, we listen to a particular voice. Mm, very good. We'll leave it there. And uh, to Father Antonio Spadaro, the door is open. We would love to sit and do a one-on-one -on -one interview with you sometime. You're always welcome on the world over. If you'd like to keep up with Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, their commentary can be found at thecatholicthing.org. Thank you both for being here.